This did not mean Walter did not love me. It meant only that he regarded me as one of his children, and therefore my farm plans were secondary to his farm plans. We were always good friends. He was unfailingly courteous, affectionate, and admiring of me, and also, I think, of the wives of his sons, Mark and Tom. One of the problems of Walter's Creek threatened farm was the groundhogs digging in the levee that to some extent held the water off the fields. Walter and Howard fought groundhogs for year, years, poking gas-saturated rags into their dens, and yet surprisingly the groundhog of weather repute, Mr. G. Hogg, as Walter called him in letters, was one of his favorite and most often mentioned characters. In his letters, he seemed to have almost a neighborly attitude and respect for the groundhog. Once he wrote, the groundhog is quite a VIP in Indiana history. A few years ago, the Indiana legislature and joint session came up with the decision that February 2nd was Groundhog Day. So Mr. G. Hogg shares, <clears throat> shares with George Washington Abraham Lincoln, Charles Darwin, W. E. Gladstone, and many others whose birthdays are in February. In another year, still thinking of the groundhog, sometimes I think I might have made my mark if I'd been born. In February 2, Valentine on February 14th, and Mr. G. Hogg on the 2nd. Naturalists tell us there is one groundhog to every acre in Indiana. I have a book that shows there are 29,000 persons in the U.S. that are 95 years or older. That average one to every 27,000 people in America. Mark Twain wrote that anyone living to be 100 years old was generally not known for doing anything else. So I do not want to live to be a hundred, Grandpa, ninety-two plus. But one other year, <clears throat> he wrote, I wish I could have been born in February. When it comes to birthdays, February is the greatest month in history. To my mind, it is the greatest month in American history. While Walter was growing from an impatient young farmer into Grandpa, ninety plus, the pattern of farming was also changing. Mechanization swept across the farms, driving the old-time farmhand before it like Indians before the pioneer settlers. The agricultural population declined as the urban population increased, and small family farms began to erode away into large farms, like unprotected topsoil into the rivers. Indiana moved from a basically agricultural state toward a highly industrial one. On the farms, the hoof prints of workhorses gave way to the, po the pocked trails of steel-rimmed lug wheels on farm tractors, and these in turn were obliterated by the wide tracks of soft rolling rubber tires on tractors, wagons, hay rakes, balers, grain combines, trucks. In Walter's later years, commercial trucking greatly shortened the time and widened the scope of livestock shipping, as practiced by his grandfathers, Levi Beam and Jesse Petten, and his father, Thomas. Thomas Petten drove cattle to market from the McCormick's Creek Farm to Cincinnati. Walter drove cattle from all of his father's farms to the railroad in Spencer. Hogs, too, were driven to the railroads before commercial trucking caught up. Hog driving required skill, tact, and sweat, but in 1958, Walter wrote me of fond memories of the days I spent with the pigs 75 years ago. A fat hog travels at a gait of one mile an hour to the very minute. I have timed them on occasions. Cincinnati and Louisville were the only hog markets open for Indiana farmers 120 years ago, and since there were no refrigerators, these markets were open only in winter. About the time of the Civil War, 
there was opportunity for high adventure in marketing hogs in Louisville. The hog drovers always took a wagon or two along a sort of hog ambulance to pick up the slow hogs that could not keep with the drove. The high adventure was for the anti-slavery men of the north to conceal a husky slave in the bottom of the returning hog ambulance across the Ohio River and start the slave on the Underground Railroad to Canada and freedom. It would require a large volume to record the history of the hog from the lowly swineherd of the scriptures to the great armor packing company handling 10 million hogs a year. Long live the American hog. We went to visit Walter one afternoon when he had been ill. He greeted us in a sprightly way at the outset. Well, I'm feeling a little better. The cattle did better than I expected. Around daylight the day before, he had loaded nine cattle into the stock truck and gone on with the driver to finish a pickup load in the neighborhood and then on to the stockyards at Indianapolis. He was home by 3 o'clock that afternoon, and the cheek from check from the commission house was in the next day's mail. He was lucky, Dick told me, he accidentally hit the best market that week. Cattle have been off every day since. A farmer counting his assets has to count in a certain amount of luck. About the only thing that remains unchanged in farming as it becomes increasingly efficient and modern is the uncertainty of it. There is never any definite, sure answer to its problems. It is an eternal gamble despite the government's effort to help. The gamble somehow seems to be part of the charm for the dedicated farmers. One Sunday afternoon when Mark, the city grandson, was home from Miami University, he came down to go caving with Joe the farm grandson, and some of his fellow students from Franklin College. On the way to Boone's Cave in Owen County, they stopped at Washington Street to show Walter the football helmets they intended wearing in the cave. They had affixed carbide lamps to the helmets, and Joe set his helmet jauntily on Walter's head. Walter told them how the Owen County Cave got its name. Mr. Boone came up from Kentucky before the Civil War and bought the farm. That was before anybody knew it had a cave on it. Of course, in Kentucky, Mr. Boone was a slaveholder, but he didn't really believe in slavery, so he sold or freed all his slaves before he came to Indiana, which had been admitted to the Union as a free state. It was actually why Mr. Boone wanted to come to Indiana. Several of his slaves followed him to Indiana and stayed on the farm with him. I knew two of them, Sylvia and Brad. When Sylvia was about 30 years old, she used to walk from the Boone's Cave farm to a farm on the other side of Spencer and do a day's washing for the family on that farm, and then walk back home. In all, a trip from around 14 miles, and for that day's work, she received 50 cents. Some of Walter's stories he liked to tell in about the same way that some people like to recite poems. Or sing the same songs over and over in the same way. Clara liked to sing the old rugged cross. These stories were familiar and comforting to him. Others he liked to tell because they stirred up facts he wanted to keep in his memory. These he liked to tell in somewhat the same way a workman looks over his tools to make sure they are all there and properly sharpened or oiled. Your mention of Homer Haydn and his drums he wrote in April 1953 reminds me of the story of probably the world's greatest drum. Sir Francis Drake, one of the world's greatest sailors, and the first Englishman to circumnavigate the globe, in 1580, had on board a drum. On Drake's return to England, his drum was placed in the British Museum, where it remained for more than 300 years. In World War days, the great German battleship Garof Spee, 
was a terror to the com commerce of the high seas. Finally, two British cruisers, the Ajax and the Exeter, met up with the great battleship off the east coast of South America. <clears throat> and in one of the fiercest of naval encounters, the cruisers sank the Groff B. A year or so after this encounter, the two British cruisers were in an English harbor for a general overhaul. While there, the British Navy gave the officers and men of the two cruisers a triumphal parade like the triumphal marches in ancient Rome. To <clears throat> lead the march of triumph through the streets of London and cross London Bridge, they got out the Drake drum, and then he had some stories he told just for the pure fun of it, stories of real people from real life like the story about old Billy Hinton. For years, Billy was a janitor at a country church, and one day he returned a box of matches to the groceryman with a complaint. He said, for years I've used one match to light both lamps in the church. I strike a match and light the first lamp and then walk across the room and light the other lamp with the same match. These new matches are too short. They burn my fingers before I can get to the second lamp. Now it takes two matches to light the church lamps every Sunday night. He wanted his money back and the grocer gave it to him. Some of Walter's heroes were the unrecorded men who engaged in livestock farming in the hard way in the early days. Let me tell you about the East Brothers, he said, one Sunday afternoon, happily. All this happened back around 1870, but I don't know what years exactly. I knew the East Brothers. In fact, one of them later owned a 750-acre bottom farm and offered to sell it to me for 100000 It had a 40000 mortgage on it, and he was afraid of losing it, but he didn't. He kept it and sold it later for 125000 He had started from simple beginnings. When Ed East and his brother Pink were fairly young men, they were... Traders lived down around Worthington. There... <clears throat> mother, then around 90 years old, lived with them. They were sort of gypsy traders then. The way they did was to start out horseback from Worthington and ride around the country buying and trading cattle as they went and gradually making their way to the Indianapolis stockyards where they sold whatever cattle they had left. It took several days for each trip. When night came on, they just stopped at whatever farm they came to and arranged with the farmer for feed and shelter for their stock overnight, and then rode on the next morning. At the stockyards, it was always late afternoon by the time they finally got all their cattle sold. Then they had a 76-mile ride back home to Worthington. In winter, it was a hard, cold trip through snow, slush, or mud, Pink used to tell me about it afterward. <clears throat> it was always late, he said, by the time they came through Spencer, with 20 miles yet to go. Pink told me, we used to look in through the windows as we rode through town and see the people sitting in their warm, cozy homes, and we wished to the Lord we lived there instead of having 20 miles further to go. When they got home, they put their horses in the barn where their 90-year-old mother had already thoughtfully put feed and hay in the boxes for the horses. Oftentimes, Pink said, they were just too tired to go any further after they unsaddled the horses. They just lay down in the clean hay and slept the rest of the night, and in the morning their mother came and called them for breakfast. That was cattle business the hard way. A fat steer, he told us once, could travel three miles an hour if it wanted to, a lean cow maybe four, but in the days when farmers drove their cattle to market, the drivers in the stock also went along at a slow pace that was comfortable for the stock, and Spencer cattle were driven into the stock pens and left there overnight to be loaded into the trains ne the next day. <clears throat>
People who lived close to the pens could hear the bewildered cattle bawling all night in the unaccustomed new place. In those early days, the citizens of Spencer were fortunate if the cattle being driven through the streets did not break and run and get on the lawns and yards. One of Walter's ambitions started with his father's triumph in the cattle business in 1871. That year, Thomas Pettin drove two oxen steers to the Cincinnati market and sold them for 12 cents a pound. They were large and netted Thomas $700, which is an outstanding record for almost any farming era. Walter had kept this in mind all during his own hog and cattle feeding career, hoping and intending some time to equal it. Finally, he did in 1950, by that time feeding systems and market transportation had changed greatly. In December, Walter called the stock truck and sent two steer steers to the Indianapolis market. They weighed a total of 22,206 pounds, 60 pounds, and sold for 32 cents a pound, paying off to the Thomas Topping record of $723.20. In feeding his steers, Walter explained, he had combined the best features of his father's system with improved ideas of his own. His steers, unlike Thomas's, had never done a day's work in their lives. They had been pastured on blue grass until they were 18 months old. Then they spent 90 days in a field of unpicked corn where they could eat as they pleased. This was a practice Walter considered an excellent feature of his grandfather Levi's harvesting system. When Walter's steers went to market, they went quickly, comfortably, in a rubber-tired truck, instead of plodding along on their own leisurely feet all the way. That day, Walter achieved one of his dearest farm ambitions. He wrote us a proud, happy letter about it. When Walter and Howard were farming together on Rattlesnake Creek, and specializing in hogs as they did for 50 years, they sent their hogs to market a carload at a time. In July and August, when the market was good, a carload was too many to haul in farm wagons. If a farmer had only half a dozen hogs or a few calves, he usually hauled them in a wagon into Spencer and shaded them with leafy bows cut at the farm and laid across the wagon bed. But before they finished the three-mile ride from the Rattlesnake Creek farm this way, the leaves were wilted, the, hot, the hogs hot and panting. When the Pettin brothers sent 50 or 60 hogs, the stock had to be driven in on foot. It was a trip with many hazards. When Walter's sons were big enough to help, they had to help, and Dick says, we were always apprehensive the night before a hog drive. We never got much sleep for worrying. The hogs had to be got to town early before the heat of the day set in. At the rate of a mile an hour, it took three and one half hours on the road, even if all went well. Walter always told them he wanted to be at the farm with the hogs up and ready to start the drive when it's just coming day. Dick told me once, it still gives me cold chills just to hear that expression, just coming day. On those hog driving days, Howard brought the buggy to Walter's house in the chilly dark hours before dawn. Walter sat on the buggy seat with Howard. The two older boys, Dick and Paris, rode the back axle, which means they stood up behind the seat. The youngest boy, Mark, crouched on the floor beside the seat, and they arrived at the farm in the dark. Some of the instructions Walter gave them for those drives finally achieved the stature of Proverbs. Never argue with anybody when you're driving hogs. They gave the right of way as much as possible to cars, and buggies they met along the road during the hog drive. 
one of the boys had to walk along the side of the drove with the special assignment of closing the neighbor's farm gates and barn doors as the hog drove went past, because a reluctantly walking hog was likely to duck in for refuge to any opening he saw. Don't crowd a hog was another proverb. You've got to let them take their time. They had to be watchful that the hogs did not overheat and die, or fall down a steep grade and break their legs, or get lost in the tall horse weeds and wild rose bushes that grew as high as the buggy wheels along the roadsides, and the drivers had to keep looking back for laggards. If a hog grew tired or offended or overwarm, he pulled off into the weeds and stayed there until loneliness impelled him to go out and rejoin the herd. By the time they reached Quarry Hill, which was also called Pork House Hill because of Thomas Pettin's earlier meat slaughtering business there, they began to meet early traffic coming out from Spencer and men going to work at the stone quarry. On one side of the road, their hedge apple trees offered thorny refuge for the recalcitrant hogs and scratches to the boys who had to run in under the limbs and force the hogs onward. On the other side of Pork House Hill, a steep grade was concealed by weeds, and there it was too bad for, for the hog or young driver who happened to roll down the steep grade. Against the tin cans, barbed wire, and other debris hidden there. A third and enforced proverb of Walter's was, if you're heading a hog, you've just got to head him no matter what you run into, sand burrs, bull nettles, or whatever is there. Having gathered speed steep down steep Pork House Hill, the hogs ran straight on into difficulties where the railroad tracks began. Five sets of tracks there made difficult hurdles for the tired, breakable legs of fat hogs. Local trains waiting on the siding added to the nervous confusion by letting off short, sudden gusts of steam, frightening the tired animals. A little farther, the drovers met women coming to work at the clothespin factory. The women, as confused and distressed as the hogs, didn't know which way to turn to get out of the way of the advancing army of hogs. They just ran every place, scared to death and screaming, Dick said. But this was the end of the ordeal. The wide open gates of the railroad stock pens offered haven to the weary animals. There they were fret fed, watered, left in the shade to rest all day until the stock hauling trains came in the evening. The train was the I and V that left Vincennes early in the evening. It stopped all along the way to look on loaded cars filled with livestock intended for the Indianapolis market, and it reached the Indianapolis stockyards early the next morning. At the Indianapolis stockyards, unloading was easy. The pens were built out close to the tracks. All the trainmen had to do was unload, was to slide the car doors open and push the hogs down into the pens. The farm shipper did not, therefore, need to go along to the market. The commission house to which he had consigned his stock looked after it from then on. Having got their hogs from the farm into the stock pens early in the morning, Walter and his crew went back that evening and by that time there was a 42 or 46 foot stock car put off for them, which they bedded deeply with nice clean straw. They used the railroad's pinch bar to push the car up to the chute, and the hogs went in onto the deep clean bedding. The men sprinkled them down with a hose until water ran out of the closed car. The loaded car was left then with the hogs in it until the one and four and five 
the, the INV, arrived late night. At that time of the night, Dick said, the train crew didn't care how much noise they made, just so they didn't injure the livestock. Cars were coupled together with loud banging and rattling. Calves bawled, hogs squealed, everybody in town knew just when the stock run finally pulled out of Spencer, and nobody expected to get any sleep until the last sounds died away as the train passed through the narrows at the outer edge of Spencer. Then even we boys could relax and go to sleep. By the time he was in his 90s, Walter Pettin had become quite a celebrity in little ways. People liked to listen to his stories, and we were, and were beginnings to say somebody ought to compile them into a book. He was frequently interviewed and photographed. He liked it. I had quite an experience at the stockyards this week, wrote Grandpa 91 Plus in 1958. The president of the stockyards had written me twice, inviting me to call on him. In one letter he said, At long last I know what name is the oldest among the patrons of the market, Pettin. The record and accomplishments of the last three generations must be most gratifying to you. He had written Mr. Chambers, the president, that the great triumvirate of the livestock industry is the farmer feeder, the central market, and the packer. This comment interested Mr. Chambers, and when Walter visited in his office at the stockyards, he took a picture of him to hang in the office, which was a deep satisfaction to the lifelong livestock farmer. One of his favorite newspaper reporter photo photo photographers was J.D. Burton, a Bloomington newspaperman. Mr. Burton photographed him in November 1960 at the polls in company with an 86-year-old acquaintance, Army Joe Clark. The two men were beaming at each other. Walter, a lifelong Republican, hadn't missed voting in an election for 71 years. Joe, a lifelong Democrat, has spent most of his life in the Army, but told Walter, I never had enough education to get any further than Captain. Although Walter was careful not to be nominated for any public office, he had been by this time Secretary of the American Shorthorn Breeders Association and was then president of the Riverside Cemetery Association and a member of the Methodist Churchyard Church Board. He had spent so many years in Owen County and Spencer that he knew the locality almost as well as he knew his own farm. He knew the people and their families and businesses. He watched the farms grow, diminish, change owners, and farming patterns. He watched Spencer businesses begin a and grow strong or fade away as sons went into them with their fathers or moved away. He saw the changes brought by two world, world wars and his youngest son Tom put on the Navy uniform to participate in the second one. He knew the spoke factory the clothespin factory, the corn parches kitchens, and saw sculptor Vikesny's American Doughboy statue become popular for placing on courthouse lawns. He knew the E.T. Barnes Dahlia farm, where it was believed more than a thousand varieties of dahlias were grown. He knew the Calvin Fletcher mansion at the outer edge of town through all the years when Mr. Fletcher sent a team and Surrey to meet every incoming passenger train because it was almost certainly had his guest on it, and many including James Whitcomb Riley were well known nationally. He knew the 28-room mansion later when E. Chubb Fuller was publishing 
a little farm magazine there, the agricultural epit epitomist, which gave its name to the hill on the road near it, and he knew the epitomist when it became C.A. Taylor's farm life and prospered, becoming for many years the lifeblood of Spencer's employment with its circulation of over a million copies a month and finally became a casualty in the Depression of 1929 when Walter's own farming operation survived by a mere straw he saw the county fairs, the poultry shows. He knew when both the Spencer National Bank and the Exchange Bank were robbed at the same time in the 1920s, and an Indianapolis newspaper reported in a banner head with two-inch type, bandits rob Spencer Banks in true Wild West style. He saw new churches built and donated the hauling of stone as his contribution to one. He saw the new school rise, and in 1911 watched a new limestone courthouse replace the old brick one that had, in 1828, replaced Owen County's first log courthouse. He saw the hitching rack and horse watering trough disappear from the courthouse square as cars, trucks, and tractors replaced horse-drawn buggies and wagons, hearses, delivery trucks, and farming implements. He had watched the town pave its streets so that people no longer walked in mud or fell over livestock asleep on warm sawdust fills in the street holes or left their buggies and cars stranded in mud when they could not drive farther. He had watched the street lights come on along the streets. He read the, with interest when the people of Owen County bought the land on his grandfather's McCormick's Creek farm and donated it to the state to become part of Indiana's first state park. Walter watched clothing styles change and told me I can tell the boys from the girls because the boys' blue jeans have hip pockets on them. In that amount of time, a man's convictions change, except the basic ones. He mellows and acquires the beginnings of wisdom. By the time he had become Grandpa 90+, plus, Walter was beginning to be aware of the real importances. One of these was the land and man's use of it. In his reading, he was alert to the connection between Owen County affairs and those of the state and nation and world. When he read in the paper that Harold Macmillan had been appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer of Great Britain, he wrote, I hand you some clippings relative to promotion by Prime Minister Churchill of Harold Macmillan to the third highest position in the British Empire, that of Minister of Defense, thus placing Macmillan in direct line to succeed Sir Anthony Eden as Prime Minister of England. The fact that Macmillan's mother was a Spencer girl in is making world history for Spencer this week. P.S. A representative of the United Press called me this week for any information I might have about Nellie Bellis. He knew Nellie as the daughter of Dr. Bellis, who was buried in Spencer's Riverside Cemetery, just about where the early beams had planted their first corn crop. Nellie had lived in Spencer in her girlhood, and Walter said she was a great lady. Of her half-sister, Flora, he said, she was my first sweetheart. The more he thought about it, the more he thought Mr. McMillan ought to come and visit the town where his mother had lived. On his trips to Riverside, he sometimes went to look at Dr. Bell's tall, narrow gravestone shaft. The thoughts boiled and simmered in the restless, logical mind of this mentally alert, frail-looking, 90-year-old 
farmer until finally, with characteristic for forthrightness and letter writing candor, he wrote Mr. McMillan, suggesting he come and visit his mother's girlhood hometown and grandfather's grave. He sent the letter in his direct hoser thinking to number 10 Downing Street, London. It was seven months before I got any answer, he said later, and laughed a small chuckle about it. I learned I should have sent my letter to the American Embassy, but I never thought of that. I just hauled off and wrote the Chancellor himself. The reply months later came from Third Secretary N.E. Armstrong on gray paper embossed with the seal of Great Britain. The letter said, Dear Mr. Patton, the Foreign Secretary is so fully occupied with his official duties, it has not been possible for him to reply personally to your letter. I have therefore been asked to thank you on his behalf, particularly for your very kind thought in sending him the photographs of Dr. Bell's home and grave. Walter never knew whether his suggestion had any influence in bringing about the visit which occurred in 1956, but in any event it was a high point of his life, an exciting page in the history of the little county seat town of Owen County, Indiana. Walter was invited to a grand reception given for the Chancellor in Indianapolis. He was pleased but declined the invitation, saying, I feel the burden of ninety years. But when Mr. McMillan came to Spencer on this sentimental journey, as the press called it, and visited Riverside Cemetery and the farmhouse where his mother had lived, and looking in through the window of it had exclaimed, it seemed so little. Walter was in the attendant crowd. The people of Spencer held a picnic supper for the Minister of Defense in the Redbud Shelter area of McCormick's Creek State Park, not far from Wolf Cave and Thomas Pettin's Big Barn. Walter was photographed in conversation with Mr. McMillan. In the photograph, most often printed, he was standing in his characteristic storytelling pose, looking down and smiling, and he felt just ready to look up into Mr. McMillan's face and laugh his little short, crankly laugh. The photograph appeared in many newspapers and magazines. So many people wrote Walter afterward that he said in a letter to me I had to buy some better stationery. Even as late as three years after the visit, he wrote, Mr. Percy Wood, longtime correspondent for the Chicago Tribune, called at my home today. He has been stationed in Judea for seven years. He was not flashy dressed, but well dressed the best dressed man I have ever met. Miss Abril saw him coming and said to her husband, the Pettins are sure going to have company today. The object of Mr. Wood's visit to Spencer was to write a feature column for the Chicago Tribune, subject the mother of England's prime minister, her girlhood days in America. He is going to Bloomington tomorrow to interview President Wells of IU about Macmillan's visit there in September 1956. With sincere apologies for burdening you with all this hot air, sincerely Grandpa 90 plus. I would have bet the farm he told Mr. Wood the cowboy's epitaph. Walter was not a musician. I never heard him sing and I think he never attempted to study any musical instrument, but he was pleased that, his two, that two of his sons, Mark and Tom, had excellent singing and speaking voices, and pleased that his three grandchildren played in their respective high school bands. He had enjoyed only moderately in his early farming, days, the music provided by an Edison phonograph and thick flat records Clara bought in her determination to educate her sons culturally. By the time Walter was writing his 90 plus letters, the Edison had long since given place to radio and TV. Phonographs 
were electric and records were high fidelity. Sometimes when we visited him, Dick and I took along a small portable phonograph and some of Walter's favorite records to play for him. One of his favorite was a gospel quartet singing of When They Ring Them Golden Bells. The one he asked for most often, however, was The Cry of the Wild Goose, a somewhat surprising choice. It was haunting. Wild ballad, popular at the time, and he liked some lines enough to quote them sometimes. My heart knows what the wild goose knows, and I must go where the wild goose goes. Once we took along two albums of Civil War music, one the Confederacy and the other the Union. In addition to the record, each album had pages of history. Illustrated with photographs, Walter enjoyed these, asked to keep the albums to read, and wrote me early the next morning, I wish to thank you for the entertainment you put on for Clara and me last evening. I was greatly interested in the Union, Union version of the musical review of the one depicting the songs of the Union Army. After you were gone, I picked up the songs of the Union Army. I just could not lay it down until I had looked at every picture and read every word of it. And then, to my surprise, it was midnight. I enjoyed every word and picture in it. It is a rare book that will entertain a non agerian genarian until midnight, every page and picture was interesting to me. With love to you all, and particularly Carol, Grandpa at 92.